Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to another episode of What's Up Doc. I'm your host, Dr. Ali Barwani, and I'm a board certified family physician. My show, What's Up Doc, is a production of Muslim Network TV, the only network broadcasting in North America that focuses on Muslims. Muslim Network TV streams daily on Roku TV, Apple TV, Fire, um, Fire TV, and Galaxy 19 Satellite. You can also find us on our YouTube page at youtube.com forward slash Muslim Network TV and on our website at muslimnetwork.tv. Today, we're going to be talking about sleep. It's commonly accepted that sleep is very important in our mental and in our medical health. And it's really important that when we have problems with our sleep or sleep disorders, that we tackle that because that can cause problems in our daily life. Joining us in that discussion is Shema Sheikh. Shema Sheikh is a certified physician's assistant and has been practicing for six years. She received a Bachelor of Science degree in general biology from the University of Maryland College Park. She then went on to receive a Master of Physician Assistant Studies at Towson University. She practiced ENT and sleep medicine for five years and now solely practices in ENT medicine in Maryland. Shema values quality patient care and takes pride in empowering and educating her patients to help them improve their medical condition. In her spare time, Shema enjoys playing basketball, swimming, baking, and spending time with her husband and her two young children. Welcome Shema, it's really nice to have you on here today. Hi, Dr. Albarwani. thank you for having me. Absolutely, I'm really excited to talk about our topic today because sleep is something that I totally enjoy. <laughs> and I understand the value of a good night's rest and how restorative it can be on our body. And as I said, in our mental health as well. And so during these times where stress and fatigue, either physical or mental fatigue can totally affect our ability to get a good night's rest. I think it's really important to be talking about this. I agree. Yes. So let's start off by going into a little bit more detail about some of the reasons that a good night's sleep is so important. You know, some people I know, plenty of people actually, including a lot of teenagers who feel like they don't need but a few hours because, you know, they would rather be doing something else and would rather be drinking Red Bulls or coffee during the day to kind of keep them going and don't really value the how important sleep can be. And that happens with adults as well. And so let's start by talking about how, why sleep is even important for our health. Yeah, so I think especially today when in a world where it's hard to slow down and there's always something to do and the more you work, the better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times people don't realize the importance of sleep. Um, and sleep is very important for our, for our bodies because that's when a lot of important processes take place and that's when our brains recharge. And so if you don't have proper sleep, then your brain is not able to recharge and the next day and the following days, you start to have irrit irritability, poor concentration, poor memory, and then down the road that can lead to even Alzheimer's and other health conditions where you um, you know a lot of a lot of metabolism processes happen occur when you're sleeping and so it can cause a lot of health conditions down the road. Absolutely. I was actually listening to a lecture um, about dementia as you mentioned, Alzheimer's dementia and how in some rat models they found this buildup of the protein that is linked to Alzheimer's dementia essentially building up in these animal models with lack of sleep. So definitely some, some really bad things that can happen when we're not getting good quality sleep. And something that I've said a couple of times now is good quality sleep, right? And so let's, let's talk about the difference between quality sleep and sleep that is affected or the quality is affected because of sleep conditions. And the first one that I want to jump into, because I see it a lot in my practice, is sleep apnea. And that can totally affect our quality of sleep in a lot of people. Um, usually when patients come in complaining about sleep apnea, they are concerned about sleep apnea. They're presenting as um, someone who has maybe high blood pressure. And their main complaint really is not even the effects of sleep apnea, but snoring. And snoring is complained about all the time, either by the patient or by their spouses or their bed mm -hmm. partners. And mm -hmm. so I think it's really interesting that um, that would be the, how a lot of people get diagnosed. 
is through that initial complaint. So let's talk about what sleep apnea is and what we can do about it. Sure. Um, so yeah, you're, you're completely right. A lot of times people don't know that they have sleep apnea because it's something where you don't see the effects of it until many, many years later when the damage has already started. And so um, most of the time when my patients come in for sleep apnea, it's men who are being dragged in by their wives because they're just snoring way too loud. And they don't even, you know, the patients themselves don't have any complaints, but it's their bed partner who are mm -hmm. who's saying they're snoring, you know, there's something wrong. Um, so sleep apnea is a condition where you can't get good quality sleep because you're not breathing properly when you sleep. Um, and so a lot of the symptoms for sleep apnea, one of the main symptoms for sleep apnea is snoring. Um, and then if the sleep apnea is severe enough, um, it can lead to poor sleep quality and that can cause daytime tiredness, daytime fatigue, um, headaches, especially morning headaches. It can cause you to fall asleep during the daytime and take, you know, take naps during the daytime, nod off, um, and then it can also cause long-term long effects such as high blood pressure, diabetes, stroke, higher risk for heart attack, higher risk for Alzheimer's. So what happens in sleep apnea is that during the daytime, you're breathing f just fine. But when you fall asleep, your muscles relax. And so um, when you're when your airway collapses, then air does not flow down through your airway like it normally should. And so if you look at the diagram um, that I have that we have here, basically when you're laying down at, at nighttime, there the um, the airway, if you look at the, the top diagram, there's a normal airway and you can see that air flows normally through the mouth and through the nose all the way down to the lungs and there's no obstruction. And that's how it should be. Air should be flowing in and out of your mouth normally going to the lungs. But what happens in sleep apnea, if you look at the bottom diagram, um, the airway becomes narrow and compromised. And that's because when we fall asleep, our muscles are more relaxed than when, we're, than when we are awake. Mm -hmm. So your tongue can fall back and block your airway. Um, sometimes it's because of obesity and there's just a lot of bulky tissue in your airway and that is not supported so much during the nighttime when your muscles are relaxed. Um, sometimes it can happen because of nasal blockage, like a deviated septum. So for whatever reason in the upper airway, the air does not flow very well down to your lungs. And I'm so- just, Sorry to interrupt you, Shema, but if we can have the banner um, removed and that way we can kind of see what you're talking about with sleep apnea, how there's obstruction of that airway that you're, discuss you're describing. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So yeah, absolutely. You can totally see where there is obstruction, as you said. And so air, air flow is not possible or very much constricted. It's very, it's constricted. So you're not, so you're not getting the amount of oxygen that you need when you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, our, the oxygen level, a normal oxygen level, um, it should be between 95% to 100%. And so during this time when you're asleep, the oxygen level, because of the, the constricted airway, the oxygen level starts to drop. And that's why snoring happens. Snoring comes from when, a, when, um, when air is trying to get down through a very narrow space. So it makes a sound. So that's why the sound occurs because yes. you're not, you're not breathing properly. And so you're not getting enough oxygen. And so the reason why you, um, you don't sleep well is because once your oxygen level starts to go down below normal, that's, that's damaging to your brain. That's damaging to your heart. And uh, a lower oxygen level can, it, you know, if, if it keeps going lower and lower, you can die if your body doesn't do something. So if you, your body detects that your oxygen level is dropping and dropping and dropping, your brain actually arouses you to a lighter stage of sleep. And so, so this happens repeatedly throughout the night. So, you know, in order to understand this better, um, I'll kind of go through the stages of sleep actually. 
you go through four stages of sleep. You go through stage one, stage two, stage three, and then REM sleep. REM sleep is the fourth stage of sleep. Rapid. Oh, sorry. And that's rapid eye movement. Yes, correct? REM is REM. R-E-M stands for rapid eye movement. And then the first three are non-REM, non-rapid rapid eye movement. Um, but the most under most important thing to take away from this is that in REM sleep, in the, that's the deepest stage of sleep, that's the one of the more important stages of sleep because that's where your brain re gets recharged and that's where your brain is refreshed. And so when you get to that deepest stage of sleep, that's when your muscles are the most relaxed. So that's when it's more likely for you to stop breathing. So once your body detects that your oxygen levels are dropping so much, then it arouses you to those lighter stages of sleep. And so when every time you stop breathing, your brain forces you to the lighter stages of sleep and you're not getting that deep REM sleep that you need to be refreshed and recharged in the morning. Mm -hmm. So for a person who has sleep apnea throughout the night, their REM sleep is being disturbed and they're getting less REM sleep and they're getting more non-REM sleep. So for a person who has sleep apnea, they might sleep for the recommended amount of time, which is between seven to nine hours hours of sleep. That's the recommended amount of hours of sleep for um, an adult. So even if you sleep for seven to eight hours and then you wake up, you still feel tired because you didn't get that amount of REM sleep that you should have. So you wake up feeling tired. You mm -hmm. wake up feeling groggy. You wake up with a headache. Then at work, you might be nodding off or you might fall, be falling asleep at the wheel. Those are all signs and symptoms of sleep apnea. And so that um, so that those are some of the other symptoms that people come in with uh, to get diagnosed for sleep apnea, and then also people who have high high uncontrolled blood pressure. Yes, um, is also another. Um, I know people with a certain um, neck circumference as well. So, um, so it's uh, oh, necks. Yes, so that's one of that's one of the telltale signs of sleep apnea. If you have, if you're, um, if you're obese or you know, if you have a higher body mass index, mm -hmm. you are more likely to have sleep apnea. Um, just because of because if you have more body mass index, you have more fatty tissue in your airway, so that you're more likely to have a more collapsing airway. But I do have plenty of patients who are on the thinner side and still have sleep apnea. So okay. it's not necessarily only um, obesity that causes sleep apnea because we have tons of people w that are skinny, but it's just a difference of their structure in their airway that causes them to stop breathing in their sleep. Of course, of course. So I, I'm sorry, were you, were you gonna go over some more signs? Uh, no, I think, um, I think I covered all of the signs. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, perfect. So as, as Shema said, essentially, people with thicker necks may be at higher risk, but that just because you don't have that doesn't mean that you don't have sleep apnea. So things to Correct. consider, of course, would be the other things that you mentioned. So signs and symptoms, excessive daytime sleepiness, waking up, not feeling refreshed, snoring, either if you're noticing it, and sometimes people do notice that they're snoring because they'll wake themselves up. It's not that common, but sometimes it happens. Or if your partner is con constantly complaining about your snoring, then that is something that you should bring up with your physician because you can probably get some good sleep if we can treat, if we can diagnose and treat you. Which takes us to the next question is how do we diagnose sleep apnea? But before we get into that, I'm going to stop you and um, we'll just take a quick break here and then we'll come back and start talking about that. All right. You're watching What's Up Doc and Muslim Network TV and we'll be back after a short break.
Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to What's Up Doc on Muslim Network TV. Today we're talking about sleep, why it's important, and what happens when sleep is disrupted and we have sleep disorders. Before the break, we were joined by Shama Sheikh, or today we're joined by Shama Sheikh, and before the break, we were talking about sleep, obstructive sleep apnea. So, Shama, that was, I, I really like the diagram that you showed us and how you really took us through the cause of sleep apnea as well as how it happens. So let's talk about now how it's diagnosed. What are the ways that, you know, we have your patients come in and there's some suspicion that you might have sleep apnea. What's the next step to kind of cinch in the diagnosis? So usually, you know, when the patient comes in and they have all the telltale signs of sleep apnea, I can usually tell that they probably do have sleep apnea. If they're snoring, um, they're feeling tired when they wake up in the morning despite sleeping for seven to eight hours at night, um, or their partner is complaining that they're, they're making choking sounds in their sleep. Um, but to really get a definitive diagnosis, um, the patient needs to do what we call a sleep study or a polysomnograph. And so a sleep study can be done either at home or in the sleep center or in a lab. Um, so obviously a, a take home sleep study will not be as detailed and give you as much information as an in-lab sleep study. Um, and so it really depends on the patient and like what their symptoms are and what kind of diagnosis we're looking for. But for sleep apnea, typically a home sleep study is good enough. And so for a, for a take home sleep study, what you do is you take a small size machine home and instructions are given on how to attach the wires to your body and um, a, a little pulse ox on your finger and it'll record your oxygen level while you sleep for two nights. And then a um, in-lab sleep study will, entails sleeping overnight in a sleep center. Um, it, sometimes it can be at a hospital or like a private sleep center where you have your own room and there will be a technician there available to hook up all the, all the wires on you. So it entails a lot more wires on you, but it gives you a lot more detailed information because it'll also be recording your brain waves and also your leg movements um, for restless leg syndrome and then um, also your oxygen levels. And so the technician is there to, to set it all up for you and will also be monitoring you for the whole night. Oh. And so the sleep study will record how your, if your oxygen levels are dropping throughout the night and how many times you're stopping breathing per hour throughout the night. Okay. I mean, using the word sleep study, I think a lot of people are a little bit scared because they feel almost like a lab rat or they're really unsure of what they're getting into and they're worried that they're going to be super uncomfortable or they will be light laying on a exam table. But you said it's your own room and you're actually in a bed, correct? Correct. And um, it, it's just that you're connected to a bunch of wires. None of this sounds painful. Is is there any part of this that is going to disrupt someone's ability to fall asleep besides being not in your home, of course? <laughs> so the fact that you are in a different environment um, mm -hmm. might might be a little difficult for you. So you are encouraged to wear, you know, comfy pajamas. You are encouraged to bring your own pillow or blanket if you want to. Um, you know, some people do have a little bit of a harder time falling asleep in the sleep center. And so, you know, we try to tell them to try to do whatever routine that they usually do at home or take a melatonin to help them to fall asleep. Um, but for the most part, you know, it's definitely painless. Um, there are a bunch of wires that can make it a little bit more difficult to fall asleep. But sometimes it is necessary to do an in-lab sleep study if we're looking for more data. Awesome. Okay. I, I'm, I love that you cleared that up, up for us. And so as someone on the receiving end of a lot of these sleep studies where I'm seeing all these different things being diagnosed, like you said, obstructive sleep apnea and even restless leg syndrome, after the initial sleep study, a lot of people are not prepared for the second sleep study after they've been diagnosed. And so I want us to just briefly talk about that as an expectation that can happen. And with that one, that's for the, you know, if you've been diagnosed, I guess that's kind of getting into treatment and what that entails as far as adjusting treatment to get maximum benefit and 
improving symptoms that we mentioned earlier, like excessive sleepiness um, and, and being able to restore quality, quality sleep for our patients. So let's move on to talking about what the treatment looks like and the process to getting somebody treated. So um, once you have the sleep study done, you have the, the follow-up appointment with your sleep medicine doctor, and um, you'll go over the results of the study. And if you are stopping breathing more than five to 15 times per hour, that means you have a significant disturbance of your sleep and you do have obstructive sleep apnea. And so the gold standard treatment for sleep apnea is called a CPAP machine. So CPAP stands for the um, continuous positive airway pressure. And so it's, you know, um, a lot of people are really hesitant to use a CPAP machine because it's basically um, a mask that you have to wear over your face and you're connected to a machine over, you know, every time you go to sleep. And it is some, you know, it is a big adjustment, but a lot of people most of my patients, once they start using the machine, they tell me that they, their lives have changed. They feel so much more refreshed in the morning. They have a lot more energy throughout the day. Um, they can focus on their work. So I do see, truly see a lot of positive changes once people start using the CPAP. So a CPAP is basically a mask and you can, there's different kinds of masks that are available and, you know, technology is improving. Exactly. There's a lot more um, comfortable masks that are available. So there's a full face mask, especially for people who are more mouth breathers that go over the nose and the mouth. And then there's also nasal only masks like nasal pillows that only go inside the nose. And that's better for people who have um, less severe sleep apnea and have don't have a nasal blockage like a like a deviated nasal septum so you can try different masks and see what works for you but basically what the CPAP machine does is it provides continuous positive pressure which means it's constantly blowing air down your throat mm -hmm. and what that does is it pushes your tongue out of the way to, in order to keep your throat open the entire night or it pushes whatever tissue that's trying to collapse during the night it's constantly pushing air through your throat to keep it open so that you are don't stop breathing so that you are getting that oxygen that you need and that it reduces the amount of um, airway collapse that you have throughout the night. And so that's the gold standard for obstructive sleep apnea. And um, that's what I see the most positive impact with. The other options for um, treatment for sleep apnea include a mouth a mouth guard that um, a mouth guard will help move your jaw forward during the night. And so um, throughout the night it, it keeps your jaw forward so that the tongue, moves out of the way. And just to um, be clear, this is not just a regular, well, I've seen different things and I've seen specific ones that are made for your mouth. So it's not something that you can just kind of go out to the soup, to the supermarket and get, correct? No. So this is something that a dentist, exactly. usually a, a dentist or an ENT will custom make for you. So you have to get a mold uh, you have to get a mold of um, your mouth. Yeah, I want to be clear because you can get mouth guards over the counter. I don't want people going out to get them and then being like, well, Shema said that this would work for me. <laughs> I wanted to make sure we were being very clear that it, it's similar to a mouth guard, but it's it's a medical device that, as you said, your ear, nose, and throat doctor or your dentist would custom make to fit your mouth and and fix your specific obstruction. So that's important to pay attention to. Correct. But the other important thing to really know about this is that it's really only recommended for people with mild cases of sleep apnea. So if you have severe sleep apnea, which is, you know, your doctor will tell you whether you're severe or not. But if you're stopping breathing more than 30 times per hour, you have severe sleep apnea. And so it's not really, um, it's not really appropriate for patients who have severe sleep apnea. It's typically only for mild sleep apnea. And even then it doesn't work 100% of the time. It may decrease your episodes of stopping breathing by a certain percentage, but it doesn't always work all the time. But it's kind of like a secondary option for people who have tried the mask and it, it didn't really work out for them and they end up pulling off their mask throughout the night. And then there's a lot more 
other the, there's more um, options that are coming out now, such as devices that can be implanted to the soft palate. And that those are more like surgical options that you can discuss with your ENT physician. Um, and that basically it's a device that get that get, becomes implanted into your soft palate and it detects every time that you're stopping breathing and it kind of sends an, a, a, an impulse to your soft palate to make it to open up again. Wow. And so um, that's a more drastic option, but it's, you know, an option for people who have tried the CPAP and um, it didn't work very well for them. Okay. And so plenty of options and hopefully more to come or a few options and hopefully more to come. And so back to what I was saying earlier about that second sleep study, I've noticed that with patients who are put on CPAP or this uh, continuous positive airway pressure device, which is why we say CPAP, it's such a mouthful, mm -hmm. that usually there has to be this second sleep study where they're titrating. So where they're kind of adjusting the levels of how much positive pressure that they are pushing through to see what's the minimal amount that we can use to get your airways open. You can breathe um, right. comfortably and pr move past that obstruction. So another part of what we had said with respect to sleep studies was diagnosing restless leg syndrome. And that is another very common syndrome or um, diagnosis that I'm making. As you mentioned, it is diagnosed, it can be diagnosed in sleep studies because they're able to monitor movement of your legs. But a lot of times it can also be clinically diagnosed just by talking to the patient and getting a good history as far as what are the things they're experiencing. So I want us to jump into that because I do see that quite often. But before we do that, we do have to take a quick break. So we're going to go ahead and do that and then come back and talk about restless leg syndrome. You're watching What's Up Doc and Muslim Network TV, and we're going to be back after this quick break.
Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to What's Up Doc. I'm your host, Dr. Ali Al-Burwani, and today we are talking about sleep dis disturbances and sleep disorders. Joining us today is Shema Sheikh. She's a practicing certified physician's assistant who specializes in sleep medicine and ear, nose, and throat medicine as well. So Shema, before the break, we were getting into all of the details about the different treatment options for obstructive sleep apnea. And so we talked about sleep studies as a way of diagnosing that, but also a way of diagnosing our next topic, which is restless leg syndrome or RLS. And so for a lot of patients who may be unfamiliar with this, we'll start by talking about what it is, but I want to share that in my practice, a lot of patients come in describing, and I would like to hear if this is what you're seeing as well, describing this feeling like they just have ants crawling on their legs, that they just want to shake out their legs. They have this urge to move their legs and it seems to get worse at night. And um, as soon as they are able to move their legs, they feel some relief. And so it sounds, it sounds made up to be honest. If I were not in medicine, I'd be like, that's a condition, <laughs> but it, it's real. And it unfortunately affects a good number of people. I read in, um, I saw in one, one source about nine to nine to 15% of people, which is a good number. And so let's, you know, let's start there and tell us what you know and what you see in your practice. Right. So, I mean, you described it basically to the, the textbook case, yeah. um, restless, restless leg syndrome is a movement disorder. Um, we don't really know what causes restless leg syndrome. It's not completely understood, but um, it's basically uh, it, it's basically characterized by this uncomfortable feeling deep within your legs, and it usually happens during moments of rest. So it's usually in the evenings or at nighttime where you get this un uncomfortable feeling and this urge to move your legs. And once you are able to move your legs or massage your legs, you get a little bit of temporary relief. And so the problem with restless sick leg syndrome is that it disturbs your sleep and it interrupts your sleep. And that causes you to have less sleep and lower quality sleep. And therefore, all of the things that we talked about before, when you have um, poor quality sleep, mm -hmm. you know, the, um, the, it causes all of the same symptoms of uh, obstructive sleep apnea as well. And so... Um, you know, a, a person with restless leg, leg syndrome will get diagnosed typically with a sleep study because the sleep study will be able to monitor how many leg, leg movements that they're having. And once someone is diagnosed with restless leg syndrome, we check uh, what we call um, uh, their iron stores through this blood test called serum ferritin. And so when your doctor checks the serum ferritin level, if it's low, we try to you know, we try to correct it to at least above 60 or 70. Um, Got it. So to be clear, Shama, sorry to interrupt, but to be clear, what, what we're saying is that restless leg syndrome can be caused by an underlying condition. And one of them is having low iron, correct? That's, yeah, that's what it's thought to be. Um, that's what studies show. Studies show that people with restless leg syndrome typically have lower iron stores. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that's one of the treatments. Also, magnesium supplement can help. Um, and as well as topical magnesium lotion on the legs can help. Um, taking warm baths and then heating pads on the legs and massaging the legs can help as well. Excellent. I know I do see this as well in patients who have varicose veins and in pregnant patients. So for for those conditions, underlying conditions that contribute to restless leg, addressing, well, you can't address pregnancy, but the hope is that it resolves with, with um, the end of their pregnancy. But as you mentioned, some things that they can do that can be safe is, um, you know, massaging their legs and then checking with your doctor, of course, before um, applying magnesium and things like that to make sure that that's going to be safe for you. Uh, and then with varicose veins, of course, is addressing the varicose veins um, as well. So as far as we talked about restless leg syndrome and obst obstructive sleep apnea, and those are the two very common things that we see that affect our ability to sleep. And something I want to make sure we talk about before we wrap up this, this um, episode is insomnia, because I feel like a lot of people 
and I have seen a lot of people in my practice come in with that as their main complaint that they're coming in, they're like, dog, I just cannot sleep, which is different from, you know, someone who's working so hard that they don't have the ability, the time to sleep. I'm talking about people who have the time to sleep, but are unable to either fall asleep or stay asleep. And it affects a large number of, of people around the world. So let's definitely dive into that. And what are some things that we can what are there some things that you're seeing or some underlying causes for insomnia, Shema? Let's start there and then um, talk about some ways that we can approach this. Right. So insomnia is, like you said, the uh, difficulty or inability to fall asleep or stay asleep for the amount of time that needs that you need to be asleep. So p somebody may wake up in the middle of the night and not be able to go back to sleep after. And so, you know, we know that we now we know why sleep is very important for us and so for a person who has difficulty falling asleep they're not getting in the amount of sleep that they need and usually the the main causes of insomnia are poor sleeping habits stress um, mental di health disorders such as depression or anxiety um, and then also people with schedules that don't allow them to, to sleep at the right time, such as, you know, people who work night, uh, night shifts. And so that kind of disrupts their, their sleep cycle. And so typically it, with uh, patients who have insomnia, their sleep cycle is disrupted. And so we all have an internal clock called the circadian rhythm. And the circadian rhythm basically tells our body when we need to go fall asleep. And it's um, controlled mainly by light. And so the circadian rhythm helps us to stay awake and alert throughout the day. And that's natural sunlight or even light coming from, you know, inside the artificial, our artificial light that helps to keep our brain alert and awake. And then when once the sun goes down and lights are turned off, those are cues for our body to start to initiate the sleep cycle. And so um, our body releases uh, something called melatonin and melatonin, melatonin is something that helps start the sleep cycle. And once melatonin is secreted, then many other chemicals are secreted from our brain to help us to stay asleep throughout the night. And so some, a lot of things can disrupt the sleep cycle. And if we don't keep the same schedule every night, then it can disrupt our habit and, our, and it can disrupt our sleep cycle as well. And so some of the things that, help, that disrupt our sleep cycle are, um, you know, staying up late every night and then our body starts to begin to get used to this new sleep cycle that we're, that we're you know, doing and this, the, it's a bad habit where we, if we stay up late night, uh, late at night to either study or to work on our laptops or watching TV, um, electronics emit a blue light to our brains, which actually inhibits the release of melatonin. And so if you're staring at a screen late at night, and if you if your brain is not secreting that melatonin, you kind of miss your sleep window and you're not falling asleep at the optimal time. Okay. And so once you miss that sleep window, you kind of, your body doesn't get into that, get into that mode of sleep because then the rest of the cascading chemicals that help you to fall asleep, it uh, don't occur as well. Got it. So that blue light definitely, it sounds like it interferes with the nat body's natural shutdown mode, essentially, or shutdown process as you prepare for sleep. So that's right. interesting. So yeah, absolutely. Screens, we, we, we hear this a lot probably in the news and when on our Google um, articles, how blue light is can affect our ability to sleep, yet that's one of the things that we're doing before we go to bed. Right. We're looking at a screen. We're looking at looking at our phone. We're scrolling on our phones. Little do we know that we're sabotaging our ability to, to fall asleep easily by doing that. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, blue light is one of definitely one of the things that's 
affecting our sleep cycle. And then stress also affects our sleep cycle. Mm -hmm. um, caffeine can help, you know, drinking caffeine throughout the day will also affect our sleep cycle. Um, being uh, our physical activity levels also affects our sleep cycle. So if we're being more and more inactive, then our then that also affects the you know um, our sleep cycle. And then just respecting our sleep time, going to sleep on time every day. Because if you if you sleep late one day and then sleep early one day, that's going to affect your circadian rhythm because it's basically like our bodies work like clockwork. So these are all things that will alter our sleep cycle. And then it's really difficult for our body to get back on track. Absolutely. Something that I, even for my parents, you know, I see kids as well. And so something that I tell parents is to have a bedtime routine. And I tell my parents as well for themselves who are having trouble sleeping is to have some kind of routine. And just like how you said darkness or dimming lights and things like that are cues for our body to get ready for sleep and rest, having a kind of a routine where we're shutting down. So let's say if it's a skincare routine at night or brushing your teeth, reading a book, if you start to get into the habit of doing those things, they also send cues to our brain that it's getting time to, to shut down. And those also help with your ability to fall asleep a little bit easier. So let, yeah. So let's talk about sleep hygiene. It's a word that I use often with our uh, my patients, you probably have used it as, as well. And it just has to do with just good, good habits around getting good sleep, essentially. And we've already talked about mm -hmm. these things. But for people in our audience and our viewers who are suffering with insomnia, before we get into medications, let's talk about some things that you generally recommend for them to do in order to, to, to try, essentially, before resorting to medications. All right, absolutely. Um, you know, so sometimes medications become necessary, um, but we we try, typically try to use use them as a last resort. Um, you know, we try to use proper sleep hygiene as our first line of therapy um, because because the medications bec can become more dependent, and then um, even though you use medications to help you to fall asleep, you're still not getting that great quality sleep as if as when you sleep more naturally. So sleep hygiene includes like some of the things that I mentioned before, um, avoiding caffeine, um, especially afternoon, um, because caffeine can interfere with your sleep. Um, um, quit, quitting smoking can also help improve your sleep. Um, avoiding alcohol, drinking alcohol in the evenings can also improve your sleep not um, eating a huge meal before bedtime because that can cause acid reflux and also just difficulty falling asleep if you're just eating a, a humongous meal. Um, exactly. And then avoiding screen time at least two hours before your bedtime. So if, you, you know, instead of, instead of watching TV, read a book, um, you know, before bedtime, especially uh, read, read something that's not on a screen or a tablet. Mm -hmm. um, um, exercising during the day has proven to improve your sleep quality at nighttime. Um, having dark room darkening curtains in your room. Um, sometimes pl um, playing like a soothing sound, uh, such as white noise. Um, I, I like having ocean sounds in my room that helps me to fall asleep. I and use that, that as well. well I, sorry to interrupt, but I also use white noise and I, I love it. And I notice a big difference, especially I live on a street that is really noisy uh, or can be, and it's unpredictable when there's going to be noise from outside. So I find that the white noise is very soothing and distracting from like these high pitched noises that might otherwise kind of shake me out of my sleep. Mm -hmm. It's it's good to help um, prevent you like to wait from waking up in the middle of the night from mm -hmm. other noises. Um, I actually started using white noise first for my children, but yeah. then I I got so used to it that, that now I can't fall asleep without it. Um, so yeah, room darkening curtains to help keep any like light out of your room that might be disturbing you, like a neighbor's um, you know floodlight or anything, and then. Um, 
white noise and then um, you can use some kind of a scent that helps you to kind of relax like a lavender spray that helps you to fall asleep. Um, doing yoga, something relaxing, deep, deep breathing techniques or yoga before you go to bed to just help your body relax. Absolutely. Those are amazing. Also, um, just in general for de-stressing, I think, like the yoga, meditation, lavender. I'm a huge fan of lavender. And so as we wrap up, I want us to talk. I know that medications, we said, is kind of a last resort because of not just dependence on it, but also um, its effect uh, it, on our natural body system for shutting down and helping us sleep. But before we do finish up, I know that medications, a lot of times we're gonna ask patients to talk to their doctors about what their specific options are, but there are some things available over the counter and um, there's uh, different um, brand names that carry like a night version of like, you know, I think it's Sequel or something like that or some version of that. And they generally tend to carry or have melatonin in them, which, as you mentioned, is also naturally produced. So before we wrap up, what are your thoughts on melatonin? What doses, if you do recommend, do you ask people to start on? And of course, all of this is with making sure that you've cleared it with your own physician so that you, or provider so that you're not getting into trouble. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, there, there is over-the-counter melatonin, which I highly recommend using. Um, if you've already tried all of the sleep hygiene methods and you're still having some trouble falling asleep, then I would definitely recommend tr adding melatonin and still, you know, still working on the sleep hygiene as well, but adding melatonin to your regimen. And so you can get um, different dosages over the counter. You can start off with five milligrams of melatonin. And then I would say typically the maximum that I recommend to my patients is 10 milligrams of melatonin. And try taking um, try taking between five to 10 milligrams of melatonin at least an hour before bedtime to give it some time to kick in. And then also try different brands because not all brands are created equal. Um, and so um, some brands work better than others on different people. So, you know, really try different brands before giving up on the melatonin. And once, once you're able to get yourself on a good sleeping schedule, then I would say try to get off of the melatonin because it's re really, you wanna use it as a temporary measure to get your body back onto the proper sleeping schedule. Um, there are also other sleeping aids that are available over the counter that have basically like um, Benadryl or, uh, mm. you know, they have Benadryl in them. Um, I, that, that's, um, I, would, I would rather a per patient use Benadryl than, um, than like a, than a, a prescription sleeping medication. Um, but at the same time, Benadryl, it helps knock you out, but you don't you don't get that good quality sleep when you're on the Benadryl. And it's I'm in my experience, it's very much habit forming that this kind of sleep that you get is I've noticed people are very much dependent on taking Benadryl and it's harder for them to come off of it. The only thing I want to add to your list of over the counter supplements that I have had feedback from that's really good is valerian root. I've heard that's really good as well, um, similar, and sometimes in some people more effective than melatonin. So that's the only other piece I would add as far as like over-the-counter stuff. Thank you so much, Shema, for joining us today. We really appreciated talking about how important sleep is, what are some of the more common things that are disrupting our ability to get a good night's sleep, and how we can diagnose that. We appreciate your time and your expertise today. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Thank you for joining us on another episode of What's Up Doc. You can watch all of our other episodes on our website at muslimnetwork.tv. I'm your host, Dr. Ali Albarwani, and I'll see you next time on another episode of What's Up Doc.